Welcome to On Microsoft. Conversations with thought leaders in Microsoft technologies. Brought to you by So, Mr. Anderson, yes. we are to understand that you've been busy recently. You've been giving some, uh, you've, you've been giving some presentations and talking about this thing called WPF, and you wrote a book on it, as I understand. I did. I've heard that rumor too. My yeah. wife's heard that rumor too as well. Has she? Yes. Has yes. She? yes. And, and and can you confirm or, or deny the rumor? Uh, I can confirm the rumor. It's done. It's published. It's out on the bookshelves, and I yeah. can. I can shamelessly plug and, and try to sell it. Now. And you so will too. I will try to. No, seriously, this this has been doing uh, pretty well here at TechEd. Uh, I heard I heard a rumor, and I don't know if either of us can confirm this yeah. that it's like the best selling book at uh, at uh, TechEd. Wow, I haven't heard that rumor. I love that rumor. I I'd, only I'd heard it. that. I oh. heard that. No, so. it's doing well. The Amazon reviews are excellent. I'm very happy with it. Yeah. It uh, people are seeming to pick up on kind of the key differentiator. I think of the yeah. book, which is good. I like. Yeah. Um, and and what would you say is the key differentiator? I think the big thing is I dig into a lot of the kind of why we made decisions, how it was how the framework's put together, and kind of mm -hmm. like a way of thinking about the framework as an end to end thing, as opposed to um, some of the other books, which are excellent books, and I highly recommend them. But uh, <laughs> but not as much as your own. Not as much as my own, of right, course. Right. Uh, but they tend to be more focused on the the APIs and the details of the system, which mm -hmm. I think you kind of need both. I actually think there's a good pairing between several right. books. So. Well, because I know, because, you know, because obviously you know this, but people watching don't. I was yeah. a reviewer on the book, and I yeah. sort of went through it, and very sort of conceptual in nature. This yes. is not one of those, I'm going to, you know, reference it as I'm writing a WPF application. This is more one, it seemed to me, of I'm going to read this in order to understand what's happening, you know, under the covers, and, and sort of get to so. zen in yeah. terms of WPF. I think it also gives you some some uh, landmarks to go look for. Mm -hmm. So, like the what are the core classes that are the kind of important ones to understand, as opposed to the breadth of you know here's the hundred control classes we have. Right. right, right. Um, so I, I I definitely agree with that. It is a much more conceptual book. I mm -hmm. think of it as a conceptual reference book. A conceptual reference book. Yeah. That's that's an intriguing categorization. I'll yeah. Have to, I'll have to sort of ponder that ontology for a while. <laughs> so give me give us some idea in terms of. Um, you know, you were, you were sitting down to write this. What subjects did you feel were really necessary to cover? And, and where's the zen of WPF as expressed oh. here? Yeah, so, so the interesting thing is the, the preparation for the book, it was very interesting because it was actually the uh, PDC of 05 or 03, I forget which one it was, but I was, uh, we were working on what is the overview of WPF overall. And that was actually mm -hmm. where I started working on how to, how I thought about the whole system and how it hung together. And so we came up with these categorization of kind of seven major components that make up WPF. Right. The application model, controls, visuals, layout, uh, data, actions, and... Uh, <laughs> I almost had that perfect, too. Uh, I, I, I'd have to go look through the chat. It, it, it'll come one. to you later. It'll come to you later. In the middle of the night, you'll sit up and go, that's what it was. Yeah, and it'll, but this will be immortalized on tape forever. Yeah, well, um, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll dub that part in later if you oh, remember. Nice. Good. Get, a little, get a little handy cam and just cut it in. You know? I like Nobody will notice. I like that idea. We can get Rory to make a comic. There you go. Uh, but so really the thing for me was to try to boil it down to those topics. And mm -hmm. so like one of the big things is I try to cover visuals as one cohesive thing, and I include text and 3D and 2D and animation because really that's about the how you get the pixels on the screen as opposed mm -hmm. to trying to do de deep coverage on each one of the topics. Mm -hmm. um, it's more about how the controls relate to the visuals and how layout lets those things compose together. So, so okay, run, run them through real quick. Visuals, which okay. is basically the, the, as you said, text, 2D, 3D. Yep. Okay. 2D, 3D. Uh, there's the controls, which controls. are basically the big the big punchline of controls is the content model. That's the the big thing there is this notion of object based properties that can be then templated using the data binding system that lets you build you know very rich UI that can be completely customized. Okay. Um, layout, which is an interesting thing of the separation of layout from the actual controls, so and from the display. Now this is layout in terms of how the controls how the controls lay out and how they fit together. Okay. Yeah. And is this? I mean, I. From my 
Java days, right? We had layout managers, yep. and we had lots of customization capabilities there where you could write your own layout manager. Yep, that's exactly. The same is true of WPF. Same sort of idea. Okay. The, the big distinction I would draw over the Java-based solutions is most of those did um, what I would call is kind of the has a layout model. So you take a control and you'd associate a layout with it. Right, right, right. right. Um, and in WPF, we, we basically used composition as our core metaphor. And so you put a layout, you put a control in a layout. Okay. And so layout's a control that you then add children to. And so that gives you a more consistent model in terms of composition. Okay, so um, then after layout, we have? Uh, then there's data. So basically how you get data inside and out of the application. And this is sort of the, the data binding story? Data binding, how you do XPath, how you do queries against <laughs> XML, things like that. And one of the things that I've noticed about data binding is it's a, it's a fairly open-ended model in the sense that you, you've got an XML provider mm -hmm. to begin with, Yep. There, is there is there an object provider? There's an object provider, an XML provider. Um, the you can use a data set from ADO.net out of the box, mm -hmm. uh, and then you can do you can actually I mean any CLR object you can just wire up as being your data source. And so the properties basically are bound by name. Is yep. That, is that properties are bound by name. Um, you can use what's called I custom type descriptor, which lets you create your virtual properties, um, mm -hmm. which is what uh, the ADO.net stuff does. Okay. And so that actually, right. you don't manifest real properties, but rather you use the stuff that's uh, from the table schema. Okay. Um, so we had visuals, components, or controls. Yep. Layout. Layout. Data. Data. Actions. actions. How you do things. So, so this is like event handling. Event handling, the command system that's built in, the routed event stuff that mm -hmm. lets you do events that bubble and tunnel and things like that. So if you bubble think of, and tunnel, bubble and tunnel. You, okay. did, you didn't know you were going to learn bubble I, and tunnel today. Hey, you know, any any and day you in which claim you learn to be something. a reviewer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't review all of the book. Jeez, now that it's immortalized on on, on tape here, <laughs> catch me in my lie. Um, the Tunneling and bubbling, is, when you have a deeply composed system where mm -hmm. a button may be composed of 30 different elements, you want to be able to listen to events on that button that may have come from the child thing. So, for example, when you click on a piece of text inside of a button, you want the click to actually come from the button. Oh, I see. Okay. And so we have this notion of what's called bubbling, which is events coming up through the element hierarchy. Um, and you can listen at any level. So you can even do something like listen to button click on a window, and any buttons within the window will come up to that. Okay. All right. um, and then tunneling is the reverse. So if I if the, the click occurs on the button, I want it to actually filter down to yes. a text element inside of it? Yes. Oh, well, okay. it's... It, Maybe that's a bad example. Well, Give me a better example. A better example would be keyboard accelerators. Okay. When you hit Control F, like the actual control that's going to get that message is like some text box that you're on. But you actually want this menu at the top level to get a shot at listening to it. And so kind of these preview events tunnel from the top of the tree down to the target element, and the bubbling events start at that bottom element and work their way up. Okay. All right, all right. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Great. Okay. And then after actions comes? Uh, then we have uh, the application model itself. Okay. So basically, what is the how the apps fit together? How apps fit together? How navigation plays into it? Windows, uh, and uh, the nav. I already said navigation. Yeah, Page flow, things Sorry. like that. Little Resources. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and th it, this is the significant difference between uh, an application, as in compiled versus a browsable. App? It. We. I get into that a little bit. Okay. Um, the WPF in V1 is primarily a compiled application platform. Right. Even the apps that run in the browser using what's called XML browser applications or XBAPs, right. um, they're still compiled, still run through MS Build, you still produce a binary. Um, but all can, that's happening inside the browser. Yeah, basically. it's all, well, the, you can browse it in the browser. The compilation's occurring at development time. Okay, but I thought, I know there's a facility where I can produce some XAML up front and it's being yes. pulled down across. You can do that, and that's okay. what we call loose XAML applications. Okay. And you're limited in what you can do with those. There's no code behind, there's no, uh, you're limited to just doing basically data binding, navigation, things like that. Right. Um, primarily because we're, we don't have any dynamic code loading abilities in those scenarios. Oh, okay. Um, okay. The, when you look at what's happening with Silverlight and where WPF is going in that space, there we're getting much more into the JavaScript-based integration, the dynamic language runtime, the right. new CLR stuff in Silverlight 1.1. So we're seeing the browser-based apps becoming more and more uh, powerful. Okay. And the last topic in the book? I, I, I'm seven? still at a loss. Still I, at a loss. I, well, I know that there's the introduction chapter, and I, th I that might think be actually counts. the. I don't think it I don't counts. Think that counts. I don't think it counts either. Well, well, we'll leave that as a surprise. It will be. You go or, by the book, and then they'll know. And then you'll know. All right. All yeah. Right. Okay, Chris. Uh, thanks for sitting with us to sort of talk about the book, and uh, thanks here's hoping. Me.
goes well for you. I hope so. Thank you. All right. For more information, visit onpodcastweekly.com and subscribe to all our podcasts. Brought to you by the publishing imprints and information portal of Pearson Education.